The well-worn cliches tell us that we all have dreams, things we want to do, see and achieve, but even more than that, who or what we want to be. But for me, there's always been this sense that our dreams are formed in childhood and they kind of stay frozen in time. That we either go on to achieve them throughout our lives, we fail at them, or worse still, we just kind of let them wither and die. But childhood dreams are just that. They're of childhood and they're a mere reflection of us at a point in time. And I believe we really need to do ourselves the favour of allowing our dreams to grow and evolve with us. Instead, as we get older, we sort of water down our expectations of what our lives might be, and we change our language to reflect this. There's also this sense that I have that dreams are something of the individual, that they're created and exist and are delivered really in the vacuum of one's own mind, and almost that we shouldn't share our dreams for fear that either we mightn't achieve them and we'll be opened up for public ridicule, or even worse still, that people will think that we're just off with the fairies. And last year I was interviewed by The Guardian, and in it, it was, a, it was about the next steps that I wanted to see for wa uh, water in, in Melbourne. And in it, at the end, I said I wanted to see people one day swimming in the Yarra River again, in the city reaches. I mean, imagine it's 48 degrees, you're at the tennis, everyone's dying, and you can literally just walk down and jump into that river, and it's not going to kill you uh, when you get out. <laughs> And the reaction I got from that article was really interesting. About 50% of people, and there's a movement happening in Melbourne for this to happen, 50% of people and peers were like, that's a great idea. Let's, you know, let's do that. And then the other 50% were like, that guy is a dreamer. He is off with the fairies. This is not ever going to happen. And my response to those people well, was, well, what am I sitting at my desk for the next 30 years trying to do? Where are we actually going if we're not going somewhere good? There are also dreams that we don't even know we have until they're taken from us. We don't dream of having our mental health until we feel it slipping away. We don't dream necessarily of having a family until someone says, you can't. We don't dream of breaking an addiction until we wake up one morning and go, I'm addicted. And that's really, for me, why I think even though individual dreams are very important, we really need to focus on the dreams of the collective. These are the stuff of human greatness, of human endeavour, and of kindness. The important thing about these dreams is that they sustain us when our individual dreams break. Now, for me, there's no better manifestation of these types of dreams than the world's great cities, one of which I'm privileged enough to stand in front of you all today. The world's great cities take individual dreams and stitch them together into a collective beauty. So, if you could dream your own city, what would it look like? I'm just going to ask you to take a couple of deep breaths, slouch down in your chairs, and begin to close your eyes. And as you do that, I want you to conjure up the vision, build your own utopian city in your mind's eye. What's beginning to appear, and where are you starting this epic task? Is it with things like the roads, the public transport system? Perhaps it's the natural features like the parks and gardens. Perhaps you're trying to preserve what you found when you first got here, and it's the waterways and the beaches. Perhaps you've got a bit more of an architectural and an engineering focus, and you're throwing up skyscrapers, building CBDs. Or maybe you're a bit more of an individual and you've started with your own home. The local village where you do your shops. Or maybe you're just stuck on a single tree. Now, keeping your eyes closed, I want you to dream yourself into that landscape that you've created. And to do that, I want you to have a good look around your city. Is your city alive? And by that I mean, are there other people there? Are there people moving through it? Or is it just kind of frozen in time? And regardless of that, I want you to hold that image and I want you to spread wings and take flight. And as you move up above your city, I want you to see what patterns start to emerge before you. 
And as you move higher up into the atmosphere, I want you to start seeking out the center of your city, the hot spots, the heat and the heart. Where is the life emanating out from? Where in your city are the dreams being made? You can open your eyes now if you haven't already. Thank you. Now, I just cheat when I do that exercise. I try to do it on myself, and I just jump straight in and picture Melbourne. Melbourne is my adopted home, hometown, and I, I love it. And Melbourne, like no other city in this country, is a city of icons, both in the physical places that make it up and in the social events that take place in it every single year. And what if I told you that, for me, my centre, my heat, my heart of this city, is a place that predates most of our most notable iconic landmarks. Places that emerged during that period of marvellous Melbourne, during the gold rush. This place came before Flinders Street Station, our State Library, our Town Hall, the Queen Victoria Market, even our first water reservoir. Yet the individual elements that come together to make up this space are almost completely new in the blip in time that is post-colonial Australia. The buildings that make up this place are an architectural and engineering dream, and they're important because they're a reflection of how we see ourselves at any point in time. But what's really most powerful about this place is how it's given us the stage for our, most, for our biggest collective dreams to play out on. In the mid-1950s, a still very much shell-shocked post-war Australia was trying to emerge, identifiable in its own right on the world stage. This place gave us the stage where we proved to the world, and more importantly ourselves, that we were of value, that life wasn't happening far across the seas. This place would become the home to our unique Indigenous code of football, and is obviously our home of sport. And it's been referenced many times today, but obviously I'm talking about the Melbourne Cricket Ground, the MCG, or just simply the G. A space so powerful you can say one letter, and people will understand immediately what you're talking about. And where else but in Australia would we abbreviate an abbreviation? <laughs> now, I came to the G late. I first stepped foot inside the G in, uh, to attend the um, charity match for the victims of the Boxing Day tsunami. And a few months after that, I came back to Melbourne to attend the Commonwealth Games. Both fantastic events. About a year after that, I moved to Melbourne and I took a job with a large engineering firm. And the thing about engineers is that they're supposed to take the dreams and visions of architects and city planners and convert them into reality. So really, they're dream makers. Not that you'd ever directly call an engineer a dream maker. They'd probably punch you in the face. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's what their job is. That's what they do. And during that time, Melbourne was in the grips of the millennium drought. The city was brown. Trees were dying, and our city planners were panicking about our water future. And at that time, we won a job with, that the Victorian government put out to, to do a water master plan for the famous Melbourne Sports Precinct. And when we won that job, I nearly lost it. I was so excited. I'd been here for about 12 months, and I was really struggling to sort of knit myself into the fabric of this city, to realise where I could make a difference. And for me, to get to know places like the MCG, and Melbourne Park and Rod Laver Arena, places you'd seen as a child on TV, I could just feel this door opening. Unfortunately, I was going to have to start literally by opening the toilet doors and seeing how they all worked in the grounds. It was during that time that I really got a sense of the gravity and the power that is the MCG, when you get to explore the back rooms and the crevices and then stand out on the middle of that field when the place is completely empty, and you look up into those stands, which are just mammoth, and they're still absolutely alive. And I also realised or found out that nothing there predates 1985. The light towers are the oldest things that are actually there. The MCG is clearly a place of dreams, and it's always easy to focus on the big dreams, the big names, the Cuthberts, the Barassis, the Bradmans, and if you must, the Warnies. But it's the little dreams that I like, and the MCG opens itself up to these little dreams every single day. If you Google MCG and dreams, you'll find countless stories in regional papers of people under-16 teenage kids travelling here to play cricket. Auskick under-10s taking the field at half-time, 
all living out their dream. In 2009, I lived my own little sporting dream there when I completed the uh, Melbourne Marathon. Now, my father-in-law, Tony Cook, was an Olympic marathon runner, ran for Australia. And when Tony first met me, he described me as a man who was built for comfort and not, <laughs> and not for speed. <laughs> and he's right, it's true. And prior to uh, meeting his daughter, I'd never run more than a kilometre in my life. And maybe it was the uplift effect or something being exposed to Olympians, but I started running slowly, slowly. And, and one day I read about the Melbourne Marathon and I sort of finishes inside the G, I've got to do this. So I dragged myself around Melbourne for four hours and 44 minutes. And as I ran into that stadium, um, you know, the feeling of just not wanting to throw up on myself, but <laughs> to, you know, to actually finish it was amazing. Anyway, Tony recounted this story a few months later when I married his, his beautiful daughter. And um, he beamed. He couldn't believe, firstly, that someone could run for that long. He just didn't think that that was humanly possible. <laughs> but in a place where he'd seen so much sporting and professional success, really, I'd seen a little dream lived out, and I'd shown him something about myself. And with that, he welcomed me into his family. Of course, the... The other thing that I really love about it was last year, they had an open day at the MCG and they allowed people onto the field. And the curators got on afterwards and there were all these little mounds of ashes. And they were like, what is, what is this? Why is there all this ash on the ground? We can't, you're not allowed to smoke in here. There's not, you know. And, uh, and then they quickly realized when they found bone fragments that all these people had been there depositing the ashes of their loved ones on the ground. So it's just, you know, pretty special story that that's where people want to end up. You're not allowed to do that anymore, so don't, don't bother to try and do it. They're, they're watching, they're on to you. But of course, the MCG is just one dream in this city made up of dreams. And my favourite walk in Melbourne is walking that St Kilda Road, Swanston Street corridor. If you start in the southern end, you'll walk past our world-class botanic gardens. And within them sits our war memorial and the Sydney Maya Music Bowl as you continue up the world's finest boulevard street and the world's busiest tram route, you'll pass um, our artistic and cultural institutions. When you cross over the mighty Yarra on the Princess Bridge, you'll then come across an intersection and it's Flinders Street Station, Federation Square, our grandest cathedral and our most famous drinking institution. And as you continue up Sw uh, Swanson Street, you will pass Town Hall, some of our original shopping arcades. You will see our State Library. You will glimpse our finest theatre. And then you'll continue up into our education precinct. It's a series of collective dreams that are stitched into one. And there is no finer example in the world of where all the necessary elements of a city come together. Art and culture, a working river, um, governance, democracy, and after you've had your education and done all that sort of stuff and been shopping, you can sit down and have a bloody drink as well, which is great. <laughs> but if you stop halfway and you dwell on that bridge and you look down the Yarra, you'll see the final missing piece of what makes a great city, and that's sport and recreation and health and well-being that comes from that. And the MCG just stares back at you, reflecting, reflecting this city back. So look closely the next time you're walking around our city. You will see that dreams are everywhere. And it's these dreams that we need to focus our attention on. If you've lost a childhood dream, or someone's taken an ax to an individual dream of yours, then seek out a collective dream. Find some of your fellow city dwellers, come up with an idea, build something together, Create something together. Fix something that you think's broken. You don't have to build an MCG. Start local, and once you see the genesis of that dream, and you see it being built, and people, and people living it, then go back and do it all over again. Thank you.